So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the launch of um, this year's democracy report titled Defiance in the Face of Autocratization. My name is Evi Papada and I am the research and policy analyst at the Vietnam Institute. Um, we are honored today to have with us uh, Thomas Miller, who is the head of the democratic governance sector at the European Commission, um, to give um, opening remarks. Um, we will then proceed with the presentation of the main points of the uh, democracy report defiance in the face of autocratization, um, which we uh, think will take about 15 minutes, and um, that will be given by Professor Stefan Lindberry, um, who is also the director of the Vietnam Institute, and myself. Um, then we invite our panelists um, to give their reflections on the report. Um, we have the honour and pleasure to host four panellists this year, um, which I will name by, um, I, by order of appearance. So we have Thomas Caruthers, who is the co-director of the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Programme at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a leading um, authority on international support for democracy, amongst other things, um, as well as a widely published scholar. Um, with us today, we have also Boniface Dulani, who's the Director of Surveys at uh, Afrobarometer and an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Malawi. Um, he has published um, uh, widely on democracy and governance, um, often with the um, uh, data of, um, on, on people's perspective. Um, then uh, I would also like to welcome Francois Crepeau, who is a professor of international law at uh, McGill University. Um, amongst other, he is um, uh, a member of the scientific committee for the um, um, European Union's uh, Agency for Fundamental Rights um, in Vienna. Um, and he also served as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants between 2011 and 2017. Um, and last but not least, I would like to welcome Alexandra Romansova, who is the Executive Director of the Center for Civil Liberties and a Nobel Peace Laureate. Um, amongst others, he has, um, as he cooperates with the OCE, the EU, um, different UN um, sections and the Council of Europe, as well as international human rights organizations and, the, and their associates uh, to promote uh, human rights. So thank you all for accepting our invitation and um, we hope that the diversity of this year's panel will make for an interesting discussion on the topics of democracy and autocracy. Um, I would also like to welcome those of you who are online with us today um, and invite you to post your questions at the, at the Q&A and um, we hope to be able to answer uh, many of them um, at the end or, or sorry, during the, towards the end of this hour. Um, so I would now like to welcome Thomas Miller um, to give his opening remarks, if Thomas is with us. Yes, I think we have to wait for uh, mm. Thomas' uh, comments till after the presentation. Okay. Um, uh, uh, ten, uh, he is he's joining very soon. Um, so <clears throat> we'll go ahead with the presentation of the report yes. and have Tom's comments after. Uh, this year's report from the Democracy Institute, Defiance in the Face of Autocratization, uh, looks at uh, several aspects uh, of the developments for democracy and autocracy in the world. It builds this year on assessments of over 4,000 experts and scholars from over 180 countries in the world and 31 million data. We'll give you the highlights of five, the five sections of the report and in just 15 minutes. First section, Democracy in the World 2022 in perspective. The average level of democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen is now back to 1986. Here's how the evidence for that looks. This is the Liberal Democracy Index, the black line in the middle, the world average, and then uh, the different regions of the world. If we draw a line back from 
the level now in 2022, as with the red line in this graph, we come back to 1986. 1986, if you remember, was the year of the Chernobyl accident and uh, the meeting in Reykjavik between Reagan and Gorbachev. That put things in perspective, I think. The region that's affected the most in this, these terms is uh, Asia Pacific region. But as you can see from the graph, all the regions of the world have steep declines over the past 10 to 15 years. This is our population weighted measure um, that we focus more on in the report than the straight country averages because we think democracy is ruled by the people, so it matters how many people are affected. And for the world as a whole, uh, it, it's, it doesn't seem to us that the advances in seashells, which are great, uh, can really compensate for the uh, declines in a large populous country like India. We also find that now we have more closed autocracies than liberal democracies in the world. Here is how the evidence look using the regimes of the world, categorization, um, it's really the same indicators that go into the liberal democracy index, but just aggregated up to regime types. You can see that red line um, of closed autocracies that the world had many of in the 70s and into the 80s and declining over many years is now going up again. And we count 33 in the last uh, uh, report here in 2022 as more than the number of liberal democracies, 30, down to 32. Um, in part, that is down uh, because of a country like Greece, uh, where that has significant autocratization and is downgraded to electoral democracy. <clears throat> to take in together these two types of autocracies in the world now account for 72% of the world population. Uh, that's a significant increase in the last 10 years from 46. <coughs> and it's really all areas of democracy that are affected severely. So this is a graph showing um, different components of democracy, and we have indices for those. Uh, clean elections, and, and this is in, in 2012, and looking at how many countries at that point they had been increasing in or declining. And with clean elections then uh, getting better in 24 countries while getting worse in only eight. Uh, look at how this compares with 2022. Boom. They are all below that diagonal line, meaning except uh, judicial constraints really, um, meaning that they're getting worse in more countries than they're getting better. And worst of all, freedom of expression getting worse in 35 countries across the world over the past 10 years. And if we drill down even further into these components and look at the individual indicators that VDEM has over 500 of them, um, here are the top 20 that decline in the most countries uh, over the past 10 years. Above that red line is the top 10, uh, and seven out of those 10 come from media, freedom of expression, and civil society. Those are the areas that are affected the most and also often the first when countries autocratize. And then I'll hand it over to you, Evie, uh, from here. Evie? <clears throat> okay. Something happened there. Then I will... Uh, Hello, yes. Hi, I was waiting for the host to um, unmute me. Okay, okay. I can Thank see you all now. Hi. So in this section, um, we look at the world from the perspective of uh, the direction in which countries are taking, so autocratizing or democratizing. A new record of 42 countries um, um, are autocratizing. So um, this is the highest ever we've seen in VDEM data. Now, here is the evidence for this. 
the blue um, dust line shows the number of democratizing countries that peaked at 71 in 1991. Um, this was a time when the prospects for democracy in the world looked certainly brighter. Uh, the steep decline continues into 2022, uh, down to 14. The red line shows the number of autocratizing countries um, since 1999, uh, and it is accelerating uh, up to a record of 42 by the end of 2022. Never before has the world seen so many countries in autocratization at the same time. Um, so these are the countries we are talking about. Um, so the greater intensity of the color um, um, indicates that there is more autocratization. So they are found in all regions of the world um, and, and many are large populous countries. Um, and we now estimate that 43% of the world's population live in autocratizing countries, up from just 5% only 10 years ago. Many autocratizing countries also are also influential regional and global powers, um, and they are also economically powerful. So that makes the trend even more worrying, we think. So, okay, which are the worst ones, right? So here is the top 10 list over 10 years, um, um, and then by the last three years only on, on your right-hand side. So on the 10-year top list, uh, democracy broke down in seven of the 10 um, autocratizing countries in the last 10 years, leaving only three democracies in 2022. Um, so even among the top 10 over the last three years, five broke down already. So this really puts things in, into perspective. Um, and what do these um, aspiring autocrats do to achieve this? Um, we don't have the full answer to this, but um, this graph shows um, one of the um, findings discussed a lot in the report, uh, in more detail in the report. So autocratizing anti pluralist governments spread a lot of disinformation um, and use it as a weapon to stir up polarization. And then they take advantage, advantage of toxic uh, levels of polarization to start derailing civil rights, media freedoms, and, and uh, civil society participation. Um, so we saw this, um, when, when, uh, we saw Putin doing this in Russia already in the beginning of the new millennium. Um, uh, but also others followed suit, um, like Brazil, Poland, the Philippines, um, India, and, and the US. Um, I'll over to you now, Stefan. Can you? Yes, let's look at the good news as well. There are democratizers still in the world, although their numbers have declined, as Evi already showed, down from 43 in 20 years ago to 14. And they only host to about 2% of the world population, so they tend to be small countries. Um, but in this year, we see something new. Um, previously, there were only, we had only seen really Ecuador and South Korea making new turns, being democracies, going into a period of autocratization and then turn around to revive democracy. Uh, we looked into this now deeper in this report and there are eight cases uh, of such U-turns. Uh, some going into electoral autocracy uh, for a year or two before returning, others making the U-turn before democracy was derailed. And there are five elements that we can see uh, unites many or all of these cases. First of all, large scale popular mobilization, often orchestrated and engineered by a, a civil society. Um, that's really been uh, something that uh, dominates several of these cases. Secondly, also judicial independence and action um, that in the end, the judiciary stood up de uh, and decided not to um, bend over for the wannabe dictators uh, and take action. Also a unified opposition. 
uh, and their strategy, often coalescing with civil society, uh, but pursuing a strategy of moderate, peaceful opposition um, to the incumbent. And using critical elections or other events such as term limits, uh, end of term limits, uh, to really turn things around. Um, and finally, we also see that in uh, 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 plurality of cases, there uh, have been international involvement from the international democracy support and protection community that have played an important role. Finally, in the fifth section of this year's report, we do something new. We look at the balance of power between autocracies and uh, democracies from an economic perspective. And here is one of the things, that the share of world GDP uh, that autocracies account for has increased significantly, or more than doubling since 1992, uh, when the Cold War had just ended. Um, <clears throat> and this is a result both of uh, uh, autocracies like China growing their financial strength, but also of autocratization and more countries becoming autocracies. This also shows in trade. So the global balance of power of trade is shifting in favor of autocracies. And we know from the uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Europe's dependence on Russian oil and gas, how important that can be. And the share of world trade between democracies that sort of is independent of that reliance on autocracies is decreasing down to 40% in 2022. Here is uh, the more detailed evidence uh, from another graph in the Democracy Report, where you can also see that the trade among autocracies uh, is going up and has more than tripled. Uh, and, in, and also then the trade between democracies and autocracies creating increasing interdependence on uh, between autocracies and democracies. These are some of the main findings of this year's Democracy Report, Defiance in the Face of Autocratization. It's available for download from our website, um, along with the data set, the new version 13 of the VDEM data set and all documentation. It's also, all the data is also uploaded to our online tools um, that you can use to explore the data, even if you don't have statistical uh, software and want to run uh, them in R or another program. Uh, on this note, Evie and I say thank you for listening, and I hand it over to you, Evie, again. Can we have Evie on again, please? Okay, it's something uh, with a technical glitch here, so I'll continue then. Um, and uh, uh, without further ado, I wanna hand it over to our panelists uh, to, for, to provide your reflections and thoughts on uh, the report and um, in extension of it. And I would like to first invite Thomas Carothers from Carnegie Foundation. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much, Stefan. It's very good to be with you and thank you for the presentation. I'd like to express my appreciation for being invited to serve as a commentator. You know, last year I was a commentator at the launch of your 2022 report, and I'm actually surprised to be back because I offered some fairly critical comments. But I appreciate the spirit in which you took those comments, uh, although I must say I don't really see them reflected in this year's report, but I know you took them seriously, and the fact that you're willing to hear from me again, because I do have some further comments that are a bit of more pepper in the soup. I think you described it to me once. Um, so I hope it makes the soup more tasty. But let me start by saying how much I appreciate VDEM's work. VDEM's work is tremendously serious and well-executed. 
And VDEM has become an invaluable resource for scholars and policymakers all around the world. I use it. I think every serious democracy analyst uses it. And I salute you and your team for the seriousness of purpose and the excellence and execution of what, of what you do. That said, I do have some issues here. And because I only have a short time, I'm going to focus a bit on criticisms, if you don't mind. Um, they're not, I think, fundamental criticisms of methodology. Rather, they're in how I think certain terms are being used by political scientists as data, but then when you translate them to a public presentation of your findings, I think sometimes give some misimpressions. Let me explain what I mean. I have five points on which I think this is the case. The first regards the shrinking of liberal democracies. The report presents the rather alarming overall conclusion they're now more closed autocracies than liberal democracies, that there are just 32 liberal democracies left. So the reader thinks, oh my goodness, the world of liberal democracies is getting very small. Who's no longer in it this year? Well, Canada. Oh, Canada's not a liberal democracy? Uh, Portugal. Sorry, Portugal. You're out, too. Austria, not a liberal democracy. Lithuania, no longer a liberal democracy. Greece, not a liberal democracy. You guys at the University of Gothenburg are pretty hard graders. I feel sorry for your students. Um, you know, it's a very tough test to get into this club of liberal democracies if Canada is not a liberal democracy. In fact, Canada is rated lower as a democracy than the United States, which I think is going to cause a bit of a surprise among um, some Canadian readers when they view their neighbor to the south. So the first is in the term, the way you use liberal democracy and say the world of democracy is shrinking because there's so many fewer liberal democracies, gives a sense of alarm that I don't really feel is justified by the data. Second, the category of electoral autocracy. As you phrase it, um, everybody living in an electoral autocracy is, quote, living in an autocracy. Thus, you have the foreboding conclusion that most people in the world live in autocracies. And you put that in bold letters as a heading. So who's living in an autocracy? Well, it turns out Ukrainians are living in an autocracy because they're an electoral autocracy in your report. So the United States and Europe thought they were defending democracy in Ukraine. Turns out Ukrainians are in an autocracy. Better call the White House and let them know that. Nigerians, who just had the election that the New York Times described as the most, quote, wide open election in many years, are apparently living in an autocracy. Filipinos living in the Philippines that had a reasonable election last year and have an elected president who rules in different ways, are living in an autocracy. This concept of living Oh, uh, it seems like Tom is having some connection problems from... See, hits up against our colleagues. They think of an autocracy which, if you check the dictionary, says absolute power by a single person or a single party. The leader of Nigeria does not have absolute. Zelensky does not have absolute. The president of the Philippines does not have absolute. They are not the only source of power. I would argue that Modi does not power in India. So I agree with electoral autocracy as a political science term, but to turn that around in a public way and say all these people are, quote, living in autocracy gives a very different impression. Third, I find VDEM's habit of making time comparisons, saying that we're back to this year or that year, it causes me a bit of analytic whiplash. Particularly, you say that Eastern Europe is back to 1980s levels <clears throat> of, of democracy. You know, if you look at the level of political openness and basic democratic procedures in Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Armenia, Moldova, Ukraine, and so forth, compared to the Soviet era 1980s and say we're back to that level, that just doesn't jive with common sense. There's something funny about the way you're presenting these things that causes an impression that I think is, is misleading. Fourth, I find the concept of autocratization very problematic in the way you present it publicly. I understand what you mean by it is any country that moves along this overall continuum is called autocratizing. But there's a problem in my mind when you say Belarus has been autocratizing. That I get. I say, yep, I, I see that. And that's the same word to describe the political process in Chile in the last 10 years, that Chile is also autocratized. It's also pink under. I'd say, wait a minute. POD is a single word to describe what's happening politically in Belarus and Chile. You'd say they're both autocratizing? 
again, I think Chileans would scratch their head at that and say, there's something funny about this report that puts us in the same category as Belarus. And then <clears throat> when you look at the map, <clears throat> Russia has been autocratizing to a certain degree, the same color as the United States. The United States and Russia have autocratized the same amount in the last 10 years. A lot of head scratching there. And you use the term in the report, this is a direct quote from your report, the United States is, quote, engulfed in autocratization. I feel you've lost a bit the sober quality that should go into a presentation of a report like this. I think most Americans would feel that their country is not engulfed in autocratization, that that term is a bit of an emotional term that I don't think is a very, it's really appropriate to a report that is attempting to be very, very fact-based to tears use. Fifth and finally, <clears throat> when you reach your democracy statistics and present them in terms of global balance of power, you talk, you use the phrase global balance of power and say that it's shifted from democracies to autocracies. The problem is the term global balance of power implies two blocks that are weighed up against each other. But wait a minute, Ukraine is over in the same block with Russia. So they're weighting against democracies. That's funny. India is in the same block with China. But India is the ally of the United States and Australia and Japan against China. And so this idea that there's this shift in the global balance of power because of your categories, you should be careful about extending a democracy analysis into a geostrategic analysis, because I think that's going to impeach you. So just to finish, I think you have an unusually restrictive definition of liberal democracies, which when presented a certain way can be confusing. Describing everyone living in electoral autocracy as living in autocracy is also confusing. Engaging in backward looking comparisons sometimes distorts more than it clarifies. The overarching concept of autocratization ends up with strange parallelisms between say Belarus and Chile or Russia and the United States. And using the term global balance of power uh, is I think confusing when that has a natural geostrategic association, which is not borne out. But I take your work seriously. I think it's outstanding work. I think every kind of attempt to summarize democracy, one's gonna always be able to pick at it. I'm trying to be helpful here in terms of how I think you present your information publicly. But again, I congratulate you and your colleagues on all the hard work that went into this excellent report. Thank you. Evie, I think you need to unmute. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. Okay. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, they're uh, well taken and well noted. Um, and I hope we get some time to discuss this later on. I, will now, uh, I would now like to uh, invite Boniface um, Dulani uh, to uh, make his intervention. Um, Boniface, are you there? Yes, I am here. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, again to our colleague Saki Videm for inviting us uh, from the Afrobarometer to uh, to be part of this, I think, a wonderful, wonderful event. Um, I should start, I think, by congratulating our colleague Saki Videm uh, for today's launch of the 2023 Democracy uh, Report. I think, as, uh, as Thomas has pointed out, I think we've come so used to using this very important resource uh, you know, uh, measuring and looking at democracy across the world. For those of us like myself who uh, focus on the, uh, gathering public perceptions on a variety of topics, including uh, on democracy, uh, the democracy report really does give us a very useful counterpoint uh, for the, you know, whether the perceptions of our ordinary citizens uh, do much, I think, the views of the experts that study and understand democracy. Uh, and, and it is really quite exciting to see the similarities that are there between the democracy reports and I think some of the findings from the citizens' voice, especially from the African continent. But before I think I weigh in on the report itself, I just also wanted to make a note, I think, as an Africanist myself, uh, some of my disappointment, really, um, that he, my colleagues on the African continent are not making use of this fantastic resource. I note from the report, for example, that he, only 3% of the data downloads are actually from the African continent. And uh, 
I would like it to urge my colleagues really on the continent to make sure that we tap in and make use of this rich resource that is available uh, to, to us, not only as Africans, but also giving us the opportunity to compare where we as African uh, stand compared uh, to other global regions. Uh, I should start by pointing out how uh, telling it is that he, the report, this year's report, highlights, and I'm going to look at this from the African perspective, highlights the fact that he, as the African continent does have a, a number of countries, the highest number of countries actually that are considered to be democratizing, uh, five, but also the highest number of countries that are, or, or, you know, um, autocratizing uh, a total of 12. Uh, this is actually quite consistent with the findings that we also are seeing from the citizen perception service from the Afro barometer, where some of the you know, so-called leading democracies on the continent, uh, the ordinary citizens themselves are beginning to tell us that, you no, know, I think things are not going in the direction that we would like to see. And uh, not with, for example, uh, Namibia, Botswana, uh, Ghana are singled out in the report as some of the countries that are autocratizing. And interestingly enough, we have also seen similar trends from the voices of the African citizens that are telling us that yeah, indeed some of these countries, Botswana, Namibia, uh, you know, Ghana, and also South Africa, among others, are uh, you know moving in the wrong direction in terms of the democratic trends. So this is why I said that this report does give us really an important, uh, an, an important counterpoint to some of the findings that we get from the citizens uh, surveys. Because sometimes people do think, oh, ordinary citizens don't know much about democracy. But when we see um, similarities between the findings of report and ours, it does give us confidence that ordinary citizens do know uh, a lot about democracy. Um, but the fact that the citizens, uh, you know, do, the fact that some of our countries are autocratizing, we should not, I think, jump to the conclusion that the ordinary citizens themselves are also supportive of uh, autocratic rule. We have seen, for example, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, when you know those countries experienced military coups, citizens went on the streets to celebrate. But what we see from our findings is that across the African continent, support for democracy among ordinary citizens remains very strong overall. What is the problem is the quality of the democracy. So on the demand side, we see the, our, our evidence suggest, supporting the view that citizens do support democracy, but it is those who are entrusted with the governing that are letting them down and delivering a poor quality uh, democracy. Otherwise, our findings do show so that uh, there is still strong support for elections and democratic institutions, presidential term limits, among others, even if a number of leaders on this continent uh, are actually going in the opposite direction from what the ordinary citizens are saying uh, are, these, are their preferences. So I just wanted to really you know, weigh in a bit with that you know, perception and just once again to thank Vidim and, and maybe make a strong plea to say that, well, considering that citizen voices are matching with what the experts are telling us, maybe in the future we should also consider bringing in the voices of the people uh, as, as we move forward with these reports. Once again, thank you for having me uh, on this panel. Thank you, Boniface. It was fantastic to have that, that people's perspective. Um, I would uh, now like to welcome uh, Francois Crepeau um, to give his intervention on this year's report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, to comment. This report is, is extremely interesting, very well supported by in-depth research. It's an impressive endeavor. As a human rights scholar, I was particularly interested in how states increasing resistance to the oversight of independent democratic institutions is a telling sign of autocratization, be they electoral commissions, universities, media, intelligence oversight mechanisms, human rights commissions, and many others. 
I echo Tom's comments and think there might be room for a middle category between electoral democracy and electoral autocracy. That might be something for reflection for the future. I would like to highlight one issue that might be missing from the report, and I would like to highlight it for the for future research, as it may affect, it will affect the proposed rankings. I generally present democracy to my students as resting on three pillars, electoral representation, human rights guarantees, and the rule of law, which is capacity to obtain redress. The report uses the term citizen, and I have not seen it defined, citizen with a small c. It certainly includes the nationals of the country in question. It does not seem to include foreigners who are part of the population of the country and who can be permanent residents, temporary foreign workers, foreign students, retirees, undocumented migrants, et cetera, et cetera. Migrants are over 280 million around the world. They often represent a significant proportion of the population, 80% in Qatar, 10% in Malaysia, 7% in South Africa. They have often lived many years in the host country. The number of migrants is bound to increase due to numerous upheavals around the world and labor shortages elsewhere. In international law, migrants have human rights, the same rights as citizens, except for two, the right to vote and the right to enter the country. Migrants have the same right to access justice and obtain redress, but migrants are not politically represented. They cannot reward or punish politicians at elections. Therefore, they do not count in the public debate and cannot influence policymaking. In particular, they cannot influence migration policies. Those are made by non-migrants, the politicians, for the benefit of non-migrants, their electorate. Just like, not long ago, policies for women were often made by committees of men. The only mobilizable electorate on migration policies is often the constituency ideologically motivated by anti-immigration sentiments, and they dominate the public discourse. Migrants do not bring their lived lives as a reality check to public debates. A small proportion of those migrants have social capital and are easily mobile. We don't call them migrants, we call them expats. Most migrants have little social capital, live in precarity, be they undocumented migrants, temporary migrant workers, especially when these have single employers work permit. In both cases, states have constructed, it's, it's a construct, social and political and legal construction, a precarity bubble in order to force these migrants to accept labor conditions that citizens would reject, including low pay, an exploitation which is often contrary to the labor laws of the country. In most countries, North and South, millions of employers are exploiting migrants, migrant workers, and labor inspections do not protect them. Because of their policy-induced fear of being arrested and deported or blacklisted, and despite the considerable agency they deploy to support their families, migrants rarely publicly protest, contest, organize, or unionize. To give you an example, uh, in, in some Canadian provinces, agricultural workers are legally prohibited from unionizing when we know that the majority of the agricultural workers are foreigners. And that's a violation of international labor law. Since the beginning of the 80s and the thickening of borders, migrants have been fantasized as use, useful scapegoats for all social ills, unemployment, criminality, pandemics, change of values, great replacement in recent years. States have deployed an extremely costly arsenal of security measures and institutions to guard borders against this migrant invasion, quotation mark. And we talk about biometrics, prosecutions, mass detention, pushbacks at sea, restrictions on the work of NGOs, security cooperation with disreputable regimes, think of Libya, and they resist oversight on those policies and practices arguing security concerns. Unfortunately, these developing techniques can leak and affect citizens as well. Even in democracies, mass surveillance is being tested on migrants, but it is used systematically by numerous states on their own population. Hungary and Poland have demonized migrants, although not Ukrainians. Australia has excellent integration policies for the migrants it chooses, but an appalling policy of taking asylum seekers intercepted at sea to remote detention centers in Nauru and Papua New Guinea, where they are left to rot for years. This is only possible because Australia 
does not have constitutional human rights guarantees that individuals, be they citizens or foreigners, can use to judicially contest the legitimacy of a majority parliamentary decisions like Canada and Australia have. Nor does it have the oversight of an international human rights tribunal, such as the European or Inter-American Court. Factoring in the treatment of migrants might change the ranking of such countries, North and South. In conclusion, I therefore posit for your reflection that the treatment of migrants is often a harbinger of autocratization and in probably a less numerous cases of democratization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francois. <clears throat> it's very insightful uh, presentation on the relationship between democracy and migration. Um, and um, I would uh, now like to uh, welcome uh, Alexandra Romansova or Sasha, as he prefers to be called, um, to give her reflections on this year's democracy report. Sasha, Hello, you... colleague. Uh, Hi. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm just a practical human rights defender and I'm from Ukraine. So uh, now I can, um, I can give my perspective uh, and sure a question of democratization or exactly falling into democra democracy in all the world is uh, more important for Ukrainian society now because Ukrainian society really did believe that uh, they are fighting for democracy values. And they know that we are transitional democracy. We know that we are young, and but but true in this way, I'm really supported by Tom. That was really painful. Read that we are autocracy. Uh, so I understood that. Uh, so I supported this moment that it's need to be communicated in other some way. Maybe really um, include some terms like transitional democracy or you know democracy in develop or something this. Uh, so uh, I, I want to mention a really important uh, understanding, and I see it's not only in Ukraine, but situation of war change a little um, possibility to exactly show some of uh, democracy institution. Uh, for example, like just example now in Ukraine, uh, which usually we have a really transparent uh, system of uh, voting and uh, working with new builds in our parliament. It's called Verkhovna Rada. Uh, but uh, now it's uh, totally uh, like secured, both when it's happened and what kind of uh, topics putting. And I understood that it's usually showing that we are not democracy, but now it's one of the needing of security. So it's just one of example. I understood that same same situation can be in any country which exactly have a situation uh, around the war situation or some, some conflict. Uh, so it's uh, I think it's really important in uh, reports understood such points like derogation. Uh, so it's situation when country exactly uh, want to uh, have some democracy values and democracy institutions, democracy rules, uh, transparency, but can do that because of some situation. But um, for understanding Ukraine uh, in, in derogation from 2014, uh, because the situation in Crimea and situation in Donbass was not in, influenced by Ukrainian authorities. But uh, same Turkey and France from the, uh, inside the uh, like use this process of derogation. And as for me, Turkey use it for exactly shrink uh, any uh, democracy institution. And it, so it's, as for me, it's really important to uh, put this understanding like situation of war and because of this derogation or situation of terroristic attack and because of this derogation from uh, country obligations, even when country told about that, we, yeah, yeah, we choose exactly democracy and democracy it's our main values and we're fighting for this, well, like example in Ukraine. But uh, I'm agree uh, with the authors of um, um, searching in about this report that it's it's true that Ukraine it's, can be now uh, like calling like total democracy or elected democracy. If you will speak about only elections, yes, elections work, but it's not work in the in the great zones in Donbass and Crimea, for example, where the election is not going because of derogation. Uh, so so it, it's, uh, it's for me, it's really needed to, to show this uh, situation because from one side, as for me, like, uh, like a citizen of Ukraine, uh, I feel that democracy started to be 
more stronger here. But is it enough to to put us from <laughs> from category you know, of uh, potential autocracy to to democracy? Maybe not. It's it's uh, your own like uh, your own measuring. So you you put this in methodology, but uh, but still, as for me, it's really important to show it because uh, in uh, in the main uh, in the main page of report exactly Iran, and if you will speak about Iranian. Uh, civil society, which is exactly now fighting. Uh, they are fighting for possibility to have democracy. Uh, but as for me, it's need to be showing in some way. So it need to be showing that in some process, yeah, they still not have normal election. They still not have uh, normal democracy body. But exactly that in some countries, these fightings and society process started. And even in Belarus, if you will speak about summer of 2020, uh, much important, like um, like a move in the way of democracy, uh, than all what happened before twenty years. So I think it's really important to to put it in the map of this uh, reporting and of maybe next uh, um, next sh- searching about this topic to putting this huge um, like new events about uh, democracy choice in these countries. Because it's not election; it's a, it's a fighting for possibility to have election. So, so as for me, it's uh, really important to show in this report. But uh, again, not like a scientist, but first of all, like a practice uh, expert. I'm really glad that we have this search. It's really give um, opportunity to look around and find the global patterns exactly. And one of them, and I'm really afraid it. Uh, you show it in like economic, uh, uh, depending between autocracy and how many autocracy now play a role inside the economic system. But it show exactly, as for me, uh, like it support my theory that even democracy state involved in process when they are um, trying to find business partners who exactly not always democracy state. I mean, if Russia Federation have a, cheap price for oil and gas, it's enough reason to have a business with them, even and look what they're doing with democracy possibility inside their own countries. So uh, as for me, it's really important. Um, it's really important part of uh, this searching. It's this question about democracy, economic, and they uh, involving both each other for, for main factors which create a link in this country. So thank you for to that you put this in this report. As for me, it's 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 need to be even developed like a search link in the next years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. And I think with that we have um, finished the round of um, panelist interventions. And I believe um, uh, Thomas will not be with us, right? So we may perhaps continue with. Um, uh, having a small discussion in the 10 minutes exactly that we've got left. Um, uh, Stefan, I'd like to invite you first to, to ask you if you have um, any direct responses to make to the panellists. Yes, uh, but m- being mindful of time here, I want yeah. to really want to, to hear one or two questions from the floor as well. Um, I will be I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, I thank all the panelists for for your your comments and and uh, appreciate uh, a lot, Bonnie, your uh, perspective from uh, from the people and the ground in Africa. And and maybe we should think of uh, having a joint report. Uh, so we would have both the institutions and the people together, but um, and and um, Francois, of course, uh, migrants is is a, a tricky issue to deal with, and typically with democracy as being about the citizens or the definitions. Uh, but but this the, you bring up a really important area, not the least because the autocratizers around the world often use migration and immigration as a stepping stone. Uh, for uh, their agenda, um, and so thank you for pointing out that, and and Sasha as well, of course, uh, and and I think you also point to some of the difficulties 
uh, I think for also for our many country experts that that really provide the data. I mean, as everybody knows on this panel, I don't sit and decide how democratic a country is or anybody here, but it's the 4,000 scholars and other experts. And it becomes very difficult, I can imagine, uh, when part of a country is under occupation. Um, and, and how do you rate the whole of the country and how much of, say, freedom of expression there is? And obviously, in some areas, there, there is none, <laughs> uh, uh, at least not for, for uh, uh, if you don't espouse the Russian story. Um, and as you said, uh, no elections for a long time in, in several areas and so on. Um, and um, uh, the, um, the, we can, Tom, of course, discuss, uh, but I think the point, one of the points uh, for me that you bring out is sort of, okay, saying there's more complexity here than the story, at least uh, maybe in the democracy report as a whole, and that's true. And I think the VDEM data makes it possible to see that complexity, because if you want to drill down, if you want to look at the details of countries and the small uh, differences, uh, you can do that. Uh, and, and I think we also agree that there's also a need to, to take a, a bigger picture and then you have to classify things into more sort of rigid categories and four categories of regime types. Also means that each category is, is kind of wide. Uh, you know, uh, electoral autocracies like Hungary and India with restrictions on freedom of expression and other things um, are different from uh, a close to uh, uh, electoral autocracy uh, further down the scale. There's a wide, like, uh, say, Turkey. Um, there's a wide range, of course. Um, but um, uh, the um, and, and autocratization can start at different levels. And thanks for pointing that out. You, I. I, I th we try in the report also to to explain how we treat that that uh, that term, um, but it's it's basically any move away from democracy and uh, having less democracy. Um, and <clears throat> naturally, you can have a, a process going away from sort of a perfect, if you like, ideal state of democracy that starts in a democracy, or starts in an electoral autocracy and, and getting worse from there. Um, and, and, and we discuss those different cases. And in some ways, they are different cases, but they are all instances of, uh, 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 of undermining democracy in the world and democratic rights and freedoms, uh, I think. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that so we have time. I wanted to hear some of your reflections. We have one comment. Uh, a question from from uh, from the floor, the one that has received the most uh, votes in democratically uh, likes uh, votes in the Zoom um, uh, about uh, the um, the point that you also discussed, both uh, Sasha and and Tom, about the the shift in GDP and trade um, and uh, and the balance of, of power as as we talk about it. Um, and the question is, is whether um, sh economic shifts drives uh, the political shifts or the political shifts drive the economic shifts. Um, and um, uh, I think the, the, our sort of uh, reason for bringing it in was really only to uh, see how the empirics look like. Um, and um, with with this sort of very recent experience um, in Europe and other places from what, what trade and economic dependence on an autocracy like Russia can mean. Um, and, um, but without making uh, any claims about one driving the other. Um, but I'm interested to, to hear if any of the, the panelists here, Sasha, you already spoke to it, although, oh, we seem to have lost Sasha. But then uh, if Francois, Bonny, Fass, or Tom have, have thoughts about that. Um, the economic strength of autocracies may exert autocratic pressures on democracies, question mark. Yes, Tom. Well, again, it gets a bit to the, I guess, what you describe as the breadth of the categories. The European Union has been increasing its trade with India in recent years. 
I don't think that's inflicting autocratic pressure on Europe. And I don't think that's somehow contributing to a shift in power balance uh, away from democracy in the world. So I think it, you're right, it's a fact. If you sort of say Indians are living in an autocracy, the EU is increasing trade with India, there's a shift in quote, global economic balance of power to autocracies, but I be pretty hesitant to, to extract much implication from that. Thank you, Bonnie. Thanks. Actually, I was going to make the same point, I think, as Thomas has said. Um, we've also seen, I think, our fair share of uh, autocratizers on the African continent that have also been, uh, that have also seen a, a growth in GDP. Uh, Rwanda, um, Ethiopia, and they, these are sometimes being touted as development, mo development models and with a number of, of people on the continent saying, let's go that way and, and maybe abandon the democratic trend. But uh, look, uh, Africa has also seen a fair number of uh, autocratic regimes that have failed to deliver development. And uh, we saw quite a lot of those, I think, from the independence era in the 1960s. So I'd also be quite hesitant at this stage to uh, generalize just based on a few cases and say, this is really the way to go. Francois, did you want to come in or should it, uh, on this question? Just a small point. The, the problem with autocracies is the issue of succession and the instability, the ultimate instability of the regime, which is problematic for business. And we've seen when there are wobbles in the rule that suddenly businesses are, and we've seen that, for example, with Russia, um, since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, you know, um, people are moving their assets out of, of, of Russia. And we've seen that the, there are hesitations, you know, about continuing to work deeply into China as well. So uh, the connection is important, but we have to remember that autocracies end, or at least are transformed, often, you know, not peacefully. And that is an asset that democracies will retain. Uh, uh, they are not necessarily permanent, but uh, they have more peaceful transfer of power. And that has an impact on investors, business people, entrepreneurs, etc. cetera. Hmm. All right. Um, thank you. Evie, um, did you have any reflections? We have one minute left. Yes, we only have one minute left. Um, um, if had we had the time, I would have really liked um, the, the panelists to um, drill a little bit more into, into the question of, um, I mean, we've seen what the highest indicators in autocratizing countries are, such as um, attacks to freedom of expression in media and in civil society. And it would have been fantastic to have a little bit more discussion on on how these um, uh, kind of kind of risks this bring up up for you know vulnerable groups in society such as um, you know migrants or or uh, undocumented people or people who live in in, in war situations and so on. Um, but um, but yeah, hopefully we can get a research grant and uh, <laughs> look into that at some point. Uh, but thank you all very much for for this uh, fantastic discussion. Yes, thanks to all our panelists, and uh, thank you, Evie, for steering us, and thanks for all uh, who have been participating here in the Zoom or watching us online on Facebook or YouTube. Um, and uh, we hope um, uh, to see you soon again. Thank you very much. Thank you.